Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Anna Edwards from Bloomberg TV. It's my pleasure to be speaking to uh, the Secretary of State for Science, Innovation and Technology here at this uh, Bloomberg Technology Summit. Thanks so much uh, for joining us, Minister, today. Um, this is a really well-timed conversation because we are a week away from the AI Summit that the UK is hosting. And so I want to really focus on that. I mean, talk about big shoes to fill. You're, you're hosting this from Bletchley Park, the home of the World War II uh, code breakers, broke the Enigma code. That sets expectation. That sets expectation pretty high. Can this summit live up to expectation? Well, I think, as you point out, it's the perfect home, really, for it to be located. But the expectation has been raised as well because from the very fact that we're doing this. So I think it's important to remember that there has been no global conversation when it comes to specifically in detail the frontier of AI. And when we say the frontier, what we mean is we mean those cutting edge models that are highly capable, that are in existence now, or are actually going to be developed and finessed. And this conversation is very targeted, very strategic. It's bringing countries from around the globe to Bletchley to have a conversation specifically about yeah. the frontier. Enough countries. I mean, we did, did a story recently that, uh, as well as Rishi Sunak, Georgia Maloney might be the only other G7 leader. Are you a little disappointed there aren't more G7 leaders, other countries in attendance? So there's been a lot a of level? yeah. There's been a lot of speculation, and the speculation has been fueled by the fact that we haven't published a list of who's attending, which you would expect with a summit of this calibre and also the security reasons as well around the people that are attending. But what I can assure you here today is that we do have high caliber attendees coming from all corners of the globe for a really rich conversation that isn't just about talking, it's actually about delivering and delivering on the very public objectives that we've set. Including from China, and mm -hmm. there will be some people who will think that's a great idea because, you know, China is big in AI and you need to embrace. There'll be other people who say, well, that's gonna change the conversations that happen behind closed doors. What do you think? Well, I think it would be naive of us to exclude China. I also think it would be the wrong approach, given the fact that we know China are a, a global power when it comes to AI. They have um, capabilities in that field. They're not just a consumer, they're also a producer. And if we're going to uh, tackle the risks so that we can lean into the opportunities when it comes to AI, then we have to have a conversation with, uh, with partners, including China themselves. Do you think, do you describe AI as more of a threat than an opportunity or more of an opportunity than a threat? I'll, I'll reveal that there was a poll earlier on in, in, in an earlier session where they asked the audience and we're talking to the converted here, a lot of people here, yes. fans of the opportunity yeah. of AI, it seems, in the room. Where do you lean? I think they're two sides of the same coin. And the only way that you can really truly get those opportunities is if you grip and are proactive in terms of the risks. And if we don't shy away from those risks, there's no point in us denying them or um, burying our heads in the sand. We actually have to say, look, there are massive risks when it comes to AI, mm. like loss of control, like misuse. So let's grip them. Also, we know the fact that AI doesn't stop at geographical boundaries. So let's have conversations and work with countries like China. OK, hence the global conversation. In just a moment, I'll get to another polling question. So just warning you so you can get your phones ready. But in the meantime, what are you doing to convince the public about the, the, uh, the benefits of AI? Because we've, we've heard a bit about the, mm. uh, the threats and some very big tech names who were at the frontiers of technology talking about uh, the threats that AI can pose. That's maybe led to the, pop, to the UK uh, people feeling nervous. So what are you doing to try and convince them that this can be a, something yeah. for good? And I think that is a risk, and it's something that I've talked to a lot of people about. I was at a roundtable led by uh, Turing Institute the other day, and that was one of the, the themes of the conversation that we got into. Because if we don't bring people on this journey with us, then uh, the adoption of AI will slow down. The benefits in terms of our NHS and, and speeding up diagnosis or utilising cleaner, greener transport won't be delivered for people up and down the country or across the globe. And we won't be able to do things like um, help developing countries to tackle things like uh, food inequality. So we really do need to grip these risks. And that means that we need to explain what those risks are to the public. We need to articulate what are the opportunities. Why is it important that we actually lean into this technology? Okay. And we need to reassure them that we're on it and we're proactive. And that's what we're doing. And that's what we're trying to do with this summit. So let's ask the uh, assembled audience here, um, with their knowledge of the, uh, of the tech space, uh, what they think of the UK's ambition in this field. Because the UK is ambitious. Can the UK lead, as the Prime Minister has said he wants to, can the UK lead the world in developing and regulating artificial intelligence? We'll see what everybody picks. And just in the, in the same spirit as this morning, if everyone picks, maybe it's 
slightly underwhelms the results, but feel free to go wherever you, wherever you, uh, wherever you feel. And we'll get those results uh, up as soon as we can, as we think about this summit, which is only a week away now. Um, there we go. Can the UK lead? OK, so a little mm. convincing left to do in the room that the UK can lead on this. I mean, what the I would say still, is that yeah. we are already leading in global safety. So we are investing more than any other country in the world when it comes to AI safety. We have um, invested 100 million as a seed startup fund for our task force. And on our task force, we've not just used the expertise in, in the UK. We've used the expertise from around the world. We've got people like Joshua Bengio, who's known as one of the godfathers of AI, advising our task force. So we're already leading the way. OK, and what does success at this, uh, this event mm -hmm. look like? We've already seen uh, that you're going to be, there's going to be a communique uh, that the attendees will sign that, is, that we've reported will contain the phrase AI is capable of catastrophic harm. Should we look for that to be one of the key conclusions coming out of this summit? So I think what we've got to do to ensure that this is successful is make good on our objectives. One of those was uh, better establishing together what are the risks when it comes to AI. And we don't fully know because it's an unpredictable emerging technology. And that means that we need to do further research. So what we want to achieve from this summit is the formation of a network to allow us to do that research collaboratively together to start this conversation and this piece of work for the summit to become a fixed point in nation's diaries. So this is the first of many. That's certainly a key objective. We also need to drill into what are the opportunities for AI? How can we access those opportunities on a global stage? How can we ensure that all countries and all people benefit from AI? So there are lots of things that we need to get into in the summit, but it is certainly the beginning of a journey as opposed to at the end. And this is going to be annual? Is it going to be in the UK? So we're having that conversation because it's quite tricky when it comes to AI because it is moving so fast, remarkably fast, faster than any other technology that we've seen before, I would argue. And so it may be that we, we set it up um, uh, every, every year, potentially, but then we may have to uh, speed that up and put in one um, every six months or something. So I think we need to be mm. flexible around the exact uh, calendar that we prescribe. And it seems, in terms of calendars, it seems that the EU is going ahead with setting out its framework. I think mm. just today we're seeing a meeting taking place in the EU where they're talking about three tiers of AI regulation, um, from foundation models to very capable systems like large language models yeah. to general purpose AI and working out how they regulate all of these. How does that feed into the global efforts that the UK is trying to lead? So there are lots of global conversations and work streams when it comes to AI, like the Global Partnership on AI, like the OECD work, like the Council of Europe's work. What hasn't happened is a conversation in detail just about the frontier. That's the missing bit that we're filling in. Now, every country uh, is taking a slightly different approach when it comes to AI. Some are um, quite far behind in their thinking in terms of the, you know, they haven't really gripped it. Some are quite forward thinking and developed uh, as the EU are, but they're taking a different approach to what we're doing here in the UK. What we're trying to do is say, OK, before we lurch to solutions, let's try and better understand the problem. Let's bring on board all of the world's experts. Let's really delve into this question. Let's also do that on a global scale, which we're setting up the summit for. Let's also be agile and nimble in our approach. Let's set out our regulatory principles like we did in the white paper so that we can give business the confidence to locate here, to grow here, to develop AI companies here. Yeah. But knowing that we are minded and understand the need for guardrails. And to find the staff they need here, that is something that when I talk to tech leaders, yeah. they talk about. I mean, will there be AI visas, for example? Uh, well, we already have um, a, a mixture of different uh, visas um, for uh, skills, uh, et cetera, and, and those looking to, to there's a scale up visa, there's mm. an innovate visa, et cetera. Um, but one of the things we've been trying to do in addition to that is grow some of our own talent. So just a few weeks ago, I announced the extension of our um, master's conversion course on AI. We also increased our number of AI doctoral places. We've uh, added more money to our labs as well so that people have the facilities. And we want to ensure that we have the correct ingredients to grow that AI ecosystem here, which is why we're investing so heavily in compute mm. and why we've started uh, to develop our Exascale program, which will be based in Edinburgh. And thinking about what you're investing in, it has been reported that you're spending £100 million on AI chips, for, uh, buying 5,000 GPUs from NVIDIA. And, and it isn't entirely clear to people why the government is buying chips and what for and what, what, what is it? Is it 
to do with a centralised AI tech resource, or what is it for? Um, so I think, I think to explain it, what we've done is we've um, invested some money into Bristol specifically, which is an AI research resource, which is part of our compute capacity. But in addition to that, we're also doing our Exascale programme, which is £900 million. So we're based in Edinburgh. And we're working with companies as well and other countries to see how can we maximise our compute capacity. As we know, it's one of the key ingredients you need for AI. It's, it's what um, Ben Buchanan describes as part of the AI quartet. And clearly with that, you'll be hoping that we don't just found UK companies, but we, keep, we scale them and we keep them, because that does seem to be another issue that when I talk to tech leaders, they talk about what is the UK government trying to do to, to, to fix that? What is the answer? Yeah, I've been quite outspoken on this. It's one of my key priorities, um, scale up. We're really good in this country at startups, and then uh, they do hit, uh, hit a point where then it, it, sort of, it goes a bit rocky, really, in comparison to other countries. And we've already started to do a great deal of work on this, mm. uh, like the mansion house reforms that were announced by the chancellor uh, the the lift scheme like the expansion of the science and innovation uh, seed funding uh, the work that's happening in my department with the digital growth grants um, but we need to do more and that's why I've been working with the likes of Tech UK and, yeah. and other partners and listening and we'll be coming up with further um, initiatives in this space. Was it a mistake to allow Google to buy DeepMind? I mean I know it's not 2014 anymore but if such a question came up now would the answer be different? Look, I, DeepMind are a fantastic UK um, story. They are homegrown here. They still um, rec uh, recruit and, uh, and create a number of jobs. They're at the cutting edge of innovation. Um, but that speaks to a broader issue, which is around why do we struggle to scale up here? And it's not all to do with the money. In fact, this was a conversation I was having um, this morning uh, with a group of business leaders. And some of it is a cultural issue as well. Some of it is about getting the right people in the boardroom that have got that innovation and foresight. Some of it is, is around, of course, the funding, but some of it is, mm. is much broader than that. One of the uh, questions coming in on the app just now, what will it take for the UK to become the tech capital of Europe? Is that, I ima imagine that's the government's ambition. Uh, no, no, we are already a tech the tech capital of Europe. The, we actually want to be a science and tech superpower by 2030. That's our key mission and driver within our department. And so how do you um, define how that? How we do that is we set out our uh, science and technology framework quite early on, um, just after our department had been created, which is basically the blueprint for how we get there. And our department has to um, work across government to achieve that, whether that be in skills, if that be in procurement, etc. But we are actually one of only three countries in the world that has a tech sector that is worth over a trillion dollars, and that is with America and China. So we are already the tech capital of Europe. There we go, the answer to, to, to that particular question from the minister. Um, let me ask you about the way that tech is regulated in the UK. Um, clearly, uh, horrific events in the Middle East recently, and some of that finding its way onto mm. social media, worrying for a lot of people. How do you evaluate how tech has done? What conversations are you having with tech about how they have done through this particular episode? Yeah. So we recently passed the online safety bill in this country, which deals with illegal content, uh, ensuring that uh, social media platforms actually adhere to their own terms and conditions, do what they say they're going to do, and it empowers adults to have more control over the content they see, as well as a whole host of additional protections for children. And when it comes to what's happened in, uh, in Israel and Gaza, we've seen horrific scenes that have been playing out on social media. Some of that content has been... Um, terrorist in nature and there are already uh, clear processes in place that social media companies need to follow working it with the Home Office and the police. So have they breached rules uh, by, um, it, uh, by so, yes. it finding its so, way onto social media? So, uh, yes because it is terrorist in, in nature so what we already did on this is I um, called a meeting quite early on uh, after what had happened a few days later with the social media platforms and got them to outline all of their processes. Um, they've all basically coded this as a crisis and have been prioritising it, which is what we want to see happen. Mm. And we've got them to put them in writing. So now we're going to hold them to account on making sure that they do what they say they're going to do in this space. But one of the big things that we've seen is the rise of disinformation. And disinformation is really hard to, uh, to be able to identify, especially in a conflict that's moving so quickly. Yeah. Um, so what we've been also making sure that they are doing is cracking down on the fake accounts. We've been identifying some of those fake accounts 
in-house in government to then be able to assist the social media companies okay. to really prioritize that and we've been working with the community groups as well and i'm planning a session with a number of the different community groups to uh, to detail the evidence that they're seeing on social media platforms so that they can have a voice direct to okay. platforms. let me ask you about another area of regulation you mentioned the online safety bill uh, Coming quick off, off the back of that, the Digital Markets Competition and Consumer Bill, it seems you might be getting some pushback from big technology businesses on what you're trying to do there, which is a, some attempt to, to level the playing field, maybe. Um, are you going to give big tech companies a right to appeal? Uh, well, there is already uh, the right to appeal. I th the question is more um, the nature on the grounds of which you can yes. appeal under. Um, we are listening, absolutely. We do listen throughout the passage of any bill. As you say, the bill is designed to level the playing field and prioritise competition, which is to the benefit especially of consumers, but also innovation mm. um, and, and everybody. And it also mirrors a similar tap that is being taken in, in Europe and Australia as well. Are you minded to give the tech companies what they're asking for, though? The ability to appeal on the grounds that they're setting out? So my approach as a minister has always been one of an open door where I will listen to all the different views and then form an evidence-based decision. And throughout the passage of any bill, I will keep engaging with different stakeholders and try to assess what changes, if any changes, we need to make in order to get the very best bill at the outcome. Okay. And that's the process that we're going through now. OK, let's get to my final polling question as we bring this uh, conversation to a close. So if you could uh, get your phones out for uh, one more poll in this <laughs> conversation. And this is to do with um, who, who is able to deliver best for the tech sector. And just to give you some context, so the question we're asking here is which party is best for UK tech? I mean, that's what we're here mm -hmm. talking about. It's talking about the tech sector. So which party is going to be delivering for UK tech? We recently asked the, the investment community on, on our Markets Live blog, um, uh, portfolio managers, traders, retail tr uh, investors, you know, which, which party was going to be best for markets. So this is giving the tech sector an opportunity to answer that very same question. And no doubt we will get the results coming through. And you, you can, you, you could, you'll either have some convincing to do then, Minister, or, or not, depending <laughs> on the results. There we go. So which party is best for UK tech? It seems... Uh, well, these polls perhaps look better than the national polls for you. <laughs> so, so maybe you've got a few friends in the room. I mean, what, what, can you, what can you say to try and persuade those who've not put your party on the list? Yeah. Um, so what I would say is we are the uh, only government that has ever created an entire department based on science, innovation and technology. And that speaks to not just how much we prioritise, but how much the Prime Minister personally recognises how important it is to the economy and to improving people's lives, not just in the short term, but also the long term. And if you look at some of the stuff that we're investing in, like compute, like quantum, etc., some of the results are not going to be delivered by the next election, but they are going to be delivered for the next generation. And I think that you need a government when you're dealing with technology that has that um, foresight and understands the importance of investing in this infrastructure and getting the ingredients right to really back our industry so that in the future we can be a science and tech superpower on a global stage. What will the legacy of the summit that's taking place in a week, what will the legacy be for the UK? Because we talked about how you want this yeah. to be a, a, it's a global initiative and it, it might travel, might move around, but what, what will the legacy be for the UK? So I think the legacy will be that we are leading the way when it comes to AI safety. And uh, we always say that those that lead the way on AI safety will actually be able to lead the way then in deploying AI for the benefit of societies, but also to support industry and job creation here on our shores. And, and certainly we have the expertise to be able to do that in government now, and we have um, the ambitions to do that. And we have already started this journey. OK, Minister, thank you very much. Uh, the Secretary of State for Science, Innovation and Technology. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.